So to rate the BM556 oscilloscope, it's partially working. I already fixed several problems in it. The broken wires to this centering potentiometer. The broken wire going to the high voltage transformer, which was arcing. Fortunately it wasn't the transformer. Several capacitors in the high voltage power supply. The tunnel diode in it, in the time base. And of course all the stack switches and poor contacts, using a bucket of a contact cleaner. But there is still some problem in it, because it doesn't synchronize in the automatic mode. So we have to fix this and then it could be a fully functional oscilloscope. Of course the other channel is working too. And the same behavior. It seems to work normally in the normal mode. And basically in the normal mode the time base is waiting for a trigger. It's basically waiting for the signal to go through a certain level and then it starts scanning. If the signal never goes through the level it never starts. You can see with no signal it actually shows no trace in the normal mode. In the automatic mode it's still scanning with no signal. And it should be waiting for the signal to go through a certain level, but there is a certain timeout and if the trigger doesn't happen until this timeout, if the signal doesn't go through the specified level, it will start scanning anyway. But it has to wait for some time before it does so. This one is not waiting for anything. And the delay circuit has to have some capacitor in it I guess, so it makes me think maybe if the capacitor is bad, it's not waiting for the trigger, it starts scanning immediately after it finished the previous scan. Here's the time base board, and previously I already tested all the transistors in it, all the diodes, some of the resistors, some of the ceramic capacitors for shorts. And the only problem I found so far was this tunnel diode, which I already replaced using a Soviet equivalent or the closest one I could find. And after the tunnel diode replacement it works in the normal mode. But the problem in the automatic mode could be maybe one of these electrolytic capacitors. And these electrolytic capacitors in an oval plastic housing are quite unreliable. They can develop a very high ESR, lose their capacitance or even go completely open circuit. And of course the bloody complicated schematic can't be missing. This is most of the time bias. It's not including the synchronization amplifier which is here. I was already explaining most of it in the previous episodes. Here's the tunnel diode which I changed. And the automatic mode switch when it's pressed in seems to short these two points. So it basically grounds this, this spot. So it looks like it sort of disables the circuit with the tunnel diode. When the switch is in the normal mode, this 12 volt rail goes via this 330 ohm resistor into this 100 nano capacitor. And this is powered. When the switch is pressed, it's in the automatic mode. This basically has a zero volt as here. And this board has just two electrolytic capacitors in it. One is somewhere on some supply rail. I guess it's this 20 microfarad capacitor. But of course never underestimate the importance of capacitors on the supply rails. And the other green electrolytic capacitor is here, in this time base circuit. It's five microfarads. And this seems to be like some timing circuit. And there's a coil with a parallel diode. I guess this circuit limits the length of the pulse from the trigger circuit to just a very short duration and it's meant to flip this circuit. But if it's not triggered, after some delay it's meant to trigger on its own in the automatic mode. But if this capacitor is bad, the delay circuit doesn't work. It would either never trigger, which is not the case, or it would basically start scanning immediately after it finished the previous scan, which could of course cause it not to synchronize. With no delay it can't wait for the trigger. And the lack of delay could be this capacitor open circuit, I guess. And the other capacitor is easily accessible. This one is not easy to access from below. But the positive goes to the collector of this transistor, which is also the housing, so I can measure on this. And the other terminal goes to some 330 ohm resistor. So if I can't get to the pin of the capacitor, I can measure on this resistor. So here's the 20 microfarad capacitor on the supply rail. This one is on the edge, so I can access the pins of it from below. The other capacitor is a bit more problematic. I can't access it because the entire time base selector is under it. So I can't get to the other side of the board without disassembling it. The 20 microfarad capacitor is about 0.45 ohms ESR, which is acceptable for a small capacitor. And of course the other capacitor which is not easily accessible. And I'm of course too lazy to remove the board entirely. So the collector of this transistor, which is also the housing, should be one terminal. And here's the 330 ohm resistor which goes to the other terminal of it. And well, 
I guess it's open a circuit. Removing this entire board from it, with millions of screws and wires going to it, or disassembling the entire time base selector, I'm too lazy. So let's just take this one out, in this professional way, and let's see. The capacitor's out, the board is hopefully not completely trashed. Here is this oval plastic electrolytic capacitor, 5 micro 70 volts. Here's the positive and negative marking. Of course I forgot how it was in the board, but the schematic says the positive goes to the collector of the transistor. Of course nowadays they don't make 5 micro capacitors, they make 4.7 microfarads, and they don't make 70 volts, they make 63 and then 100. So this is probably the closest replacement, and it's about 1 ohm ESR, which for such low capacitance is definitely acceptable. This one doesn't even go that low. And the actual capacitance is just 4.2. Well, let's hope it's not critical. Let's botch solder it in. The capacitor is horribly botched in. And testing time. Let's switch it from normal to automatic. And it's still working. Nice. And in the automatic, when I remove the signal, the line remains. It's still scanning. But in the normal mode, when I remove the signal, it's not scanning, the line disappears. It seems replacing the capacitor actually fixed it. And also this yellow LED is now lighting up. Notice that you can see it under the bright studio lights, but it's lighting up now, indicating it's triggering. Of course these LEDs from the 80s are dim, but when I remove the signal you can see the LED turning off. Now it's synchronizing nicely even in the automatic mode. And the LED in the schematic is actually here. It took me some time to find it. Here's the capacitor I replaced, some transistors, and from this transistor via a resistor it goes into the LED and then into the zero volt rail. So the time base is good now. Now let's check the capacitors in the vertical amplifiers. Each channel has three of these questionable capacitors. The rest of the capacitors seem to be tantalum drops, or ceramic capacitors of course. And I already checked most of the electrolytic capacitors in the power supply. And these are showing around 0 0.15 ohm ESR. This is just 50 milliohms. Some of them are good, some acceptable, and they are not at the same values actually. And of course I forgot about these. These two are in parallel. Not bad. And this one is definitely the crappiest one so far. 7 ohms ESR, quite high for a 500 micro capacitor. All these pink ones are 200 or 500 micro, and they're between 60 and 160 milliohms. So among all the big electrolytic capacitors in it, this one is the only bad one. 7 ohms for a 500 micro capacitor is quite a lot. In this table the closest one is 470 micro, and closest to 70 volts is 63 volts, and this shows 0 0.09 ohms ESR. So 7 ohms is almost two orders of magnitude higher. And also when replacing this capacitor, this interference filter is in the way. And I have to replace it anyway. The X capacitor in it, the life to neutral capacitor, is a paper capacitor, which deteriorates and explodes, or shorts or develops a massive leakage current, and spills a horrible waxy oily liquid everywhere, and blows the fuse. Of course, given the fuse was before the filter. And here's the schematic with the power supply, and the interference suppression module is here. And the life in a neutral goes into the interference suppression module first, and then into a fuse, and then into the switch. This really seems like a good idea. And they were using the exact same filter absolutely in every appliance back then. How am I supposed to get to the screw on the other side of the filter? Absolutely no way. I also can't slide it out. Here are some terminals. Here's the terminal going through the metal. Maybe if I turn it, I can somehow get it out. But of course, most importantly, I have to document how the wires are going from it. Now it's out. I just had to cut the ground wire from it. And yes, it's already cracking. And something sticky is spilling from it. TC241, a filter used in absolutely everything in Czechoslovakia in the 70s and 80s, 2 times 10 micro Henry, 100 nano and 2 times 2.5 nano basically, and maximum current 2.5 amps. Another crack, and the date code NN, 
and I have a lot of same shaped filters here, which are very similar, as they're using a plastic film capacitor instead of a paper capacitor. This one was paper, these are polyester or polypropylene. And these five terminal filters contain two inductors, which might be on a common core or might not be, and three capacitors, two Y capacitors, live to ground and a neutral to ground, and one X capacitor, live to neutral. And this one is the one that fails in the old ones. And of course the big confusion with these filters is which side is the input and which one is the output. The ground is obvious, it's yellow, green or this transparent insulation or in some of them these tabs. But which pair of wires is the input and which pair is the output? Or basically which pair is on the capacitor side and which pair is on the inductor side? And you might say these two are the ones closer to the ground, but it's not the case. Here it's the case, these are on the capacitor side, but here it's the other way. The ones farther from the ground are on the capacitive side, or on the side of these capacitors basically. So these filters are absolutely all over the place. Not sure how much difference does it make, which one is the input, which one is the output, but I guess the input should be on the capacitor side, correct me if I'm wrong. I guess there is no way you can tell it by looking at the filter. So let's use a ring tester to test where the inductors are. I'm going to use a random 36 nano capacitor for the ring test. This is the inductor terminal, a pair of terminals. And when I connect it to some filter, let's basically connect it to this pair of terminals. And let's short the other pair of terminals. And what happens? It shows zero rings. So this actually means I'm now probing this pair of terminals and shorting the ones on the inductor side. I'm connecting the inductor ring test terminals to the capacitor. That's why no rings. When I go the other way and connect the ring tester to the other pair of terminals, which I guess are these two, and I short the other ones, which I guess are the capacitor side, it's showing six rings. So now I am basically shorting the capacitor and ring testing these inductors in a series and no capacitor is connected to the terminals of the ring tester. So let's mark it, this is the capacitor side. And I can do the similar thing in the old one, connecting this to these terminals and shorting the other pair, zero rings, so I'm on the capacitor, let's turn it and this pair, shorting the other one, and four rings, so these are the inductors, and I'm shorting the capacitor side. And I documented the terminal block it was connected to, and it seems the mains is actually coming in from this side, coming out from this side. Of course the question is, is it intentional or do they just put the filter in completely randomly? But anyway, I'm putting the new filter in the way it was, despite I thought the capacitive side is the input. But of course very often these interference filters have capacitors on both sides of the inductor, here and here. Of course another question is, is the filter meant to stop the interference from going in or from going out? Maybe when the appliance is something like a switching power supply or a brushed motor, the filter is meant to stop the interference from going out. So this would be the main side, and this would be the motor. But in an oscilloscope it's probably meant to stop the interference from going in. Now this capacitor is out. 500 micro 70 volts. After sitting overnight it actually got even worse. 8.5 ohms ESR. And the capacitance 180 microfarads. The closest I have is 470 micro 63 volts. Of course it's better to use a higher voltage rating, as this one has 40 volts on it anyway. And it's much smaller, so the holder no longer does its job here. The capacitor is horribly botched in. I wrapped it in a Kapton tape and I used the end of a zip tie to prevent the pins from bending right next to the capacitor. And the new filter is soldered in. Nice! The filter is mounted in. And the ESR of the new capacitor is just 80 milliohms. And when I try to ring test the capacitor in the new filters, the X capacitor, together with this inductor with a high Q factor, it's showing 65 rings. This one 64 rings. A very low dissipation factor. So these capacitors are probably polypropylene. And this old interference module is showing about 20 rings. So I guess the capacitor is polyester. And this old paper capacitor in this filter, completely rotten, shows just 7 rings. Horrible. And it should be 100, no, no, it shows 185, it has drifted a lot. And in the good ones the capacitor has virtually no leakage current. It just charges and stays charged. It charges slowly and discharges itself every time.
And this rotten paper capacitor has a lot of leakage current. It's working nicely, but why the LED stopped working? Measuring on the LED, it has full 12 volts on it, from the 12 volt supply rail. What the hell happened to the poor LED? It seems it went open a circuit. Trying to get it out. Open a circuit. Let's replace it with some old stock LED because a modern super bright LED would be completely out of place here. A modern yellow LED versus two old ones. You can see the difference. Nice! And still a bit brighter than the original. And of course I completely digressed. I was going to test these 10 micro green electrolytic capacitors in plastic housings. The first one 0.4 ohms, which is good for just 10 microfarad capacitor. The second one completely open circuit. The third one 0.48. One capacitor changed so far. And the same circuit refers the other channel. And here all three capacitors are good. All from 0 0.4 to 0.5 ohms ESR. And testing the capacitor I removed again and now it reads good. Oh crap, the probes were just not making a good contact. But anyway, I will keep the capacitor. It actually drifted from 10 to 16.5 micro. It has a little bit of leakage current but not much. which the modern one doesn't have. And the modern one actually has a higher ESR than the original, about the double. But I guess still acceptable. The table allows up to 2.4 ohms. And of course these are just very ballpark numbers. Of course you can find tons of these tables on the internet and each of them will give slightly different numbers. For 10 micro 63 volts this one gives 1.9 ohms. This one 9.3 ohms. This seems a bit high to me. And this one 3.5 ohms. This one 12 ohms. This seems way too high to me. And this one says 1.03 ohms. This table is giving quite low numbers. The new capacitor would be on the threshold here. You have to take these tables with a massive bucket of salt. I'd say a reasonable threshold for this is about 2 or 3 ohms. If the ESR is higher, it's probably bad. And the 10 micro capacitors are in the vertical preamplifier here, here, and here. One microfarad 250 volt capacitor is about 3 ohms here, but this is acceptable for such low capacitance. And three capacitors in the trigger circuitry, or synchronization amplifier, all of them between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 ohms. And a 20 microfarad capacitor in the calibrator seems open a circuit. Of course this thing is not necessary for the main thing to operate. It's just for this, but let's replace it anyway. This time I'm making sure it's not just a poor contact again. But here the rubber seal is actually popping out from it. And it's interesting, it still shows about 20 micro on a capacitance meter. But an open circuit on the ESR meter, which goes up to 100 ohms. So the ESR has to be over 100 ohms. I'm really making sure it's not a poor contact. A new 22 micro 25 volts shows 0 0.4 ohms ESR. 22 micro 63 volts almost 0 0.5 ohms. 22 micro 200 volts about 1 ohm. 22 micro 400 volts 1.8 ohms. It's the same capacitance, but as the voltage rating goes up, the ESR also seems to go up. But it doesn't have to be always the rule. I'm going to use the 25 volt one because it's enough. The original was 15 volts and I don't have a 16 volt version. And the new capacitors in. Here's the calibrator output. And it's working nicely now. Of course the next component can fail any time but this applies to human organs as well. I put the cover on this one and the next oscilloscope to fix is this one. A bigger brother of this one. It's a 120 MHz two channel and dual time base oscilloscope. I'd really like to see an oscilloscope with two time bases in operation. In this one both channels are working, both vertical amplifiers are amplifying, but the time bases are dead. So that's it and if you like my videos, really consider supporting this channel on Patreon or using the thanks button and also subscribing because this channel couldn't exist without you. And I really have to say thanks to everyone who already supports me.